Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm Amaral Walker in for Frederica Whitfield. We do start with breaking news. Republican Senator Rand Paul now saying he will vote to block President Trump's emergency declaration. That now makes four members of the president's own party in the Senate vowing to go against Trump's move to fulfill his biggest campaign promise, building the wall along the southern border. This means the resolution of disapproval will most likely make it to the president's desk, where he has warned he will use his first presidential veto. Let's check in with CNN's White House correspondent Boris Sanchez. And Boris, four was the magic number of Republican senators needed to pass this resolution. It looks like they now have that number. Quite a big blow to the president, even if he may have expected this. Oh, that's right, Amara. We sort of expected this to happen because Republicans, uh, Republican lawmakers have publicly and privately warned President Trump that a vote on his national emergency declaration could potentially uh, splinter the party. And now you have Rand Paul joining, as you said, three other Republican senators, including Susan Collins of Maine, uh, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, and Tom Tillis of North Carolina, essentially voting to block this declaration. I want to read to you a bit of what Rand Paul told supporters last night in Kentucky when he announced that he would uh, cast his vote against the declaration. He said, quote, I can't vote to give the president the power to spend money that hasn't been appropriated by Congress. We may want more money for border security, uh, but Congress didn't authorize it. If we take away those checks and balances, it is a dangerous thing. So Rand Paul essentially uh, saying what we've heard from other Republicans, that uh, this national emergency declaration could set a dangerous precedent. Despite all of this, it is largely a symbolic move because President Trump has vowed to veto it. Listen to this. Will I veto it? 100 percent. 100 percent. And I don't think it survives a veto. We have too many smart people that want border security, so I can't imagine it could survive a veto. But I will veto it, yes. There is simply not enough votes in Congress right now to overturn a presidential veto. Uh, we should note it's unclear exactly when the Senate is going to vote on this. Uh, after the House passed it, they had about 18 days uh, to hold a vote. That means that they now approximately have two weeks uh, to cast the ballot. Amara. And Boris, just to make uh, it clear, I mean, the Republicans who are backing this resolution that would overturn President Trump's emergency declaration, this isn't about being against the wall. This is about sending a message to the president. Look, we are serious about separation of powers. We in Congress are the ones who have the power of the purse. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what we've heard repeatedly from a number of Republican lawmakers. At one point, you even had, according to sources, uh, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell visit the White House to tell the president not to do this because of the complications that it could present uh, for Republicans moving forward. Despite that, President Trump wanted to go ahead with this. Ultimately, he decided uh, to vote for a bill that would reopen the federal government. Uh, but not give him money for the border wall. And he essentially sought a loophole around the loophole, as he said yesterday uh, during a speech at CPAC, Emra. All right, Boris Sanchez, live for us there at the White House. Great to see you. Thanks, Boris. Well, the other big story we are following today, Democrats vowing to ramp up their investigations into President Trump. Today, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee says he will be requesting documents from some 60 people as Congress investigates the president for possible obstruction of justice, corruption, and abuse of power. Now, some of those being targeted include top officials at Trump's businesses and several members of the president's family, including Donald Trump Jr., Do you think the president obstructed justice? Yes, I do. If it, it's very clear that the president obstructed justice. It's very clear. Uh, 1,100 times he referred to the Mueller investigation as a witch hunt. He tried to, f he, f he fired, uh, uh, he tried to protect uh, Flynn from being uh, investigated by the, uh, by the FBI. He fired Comey in order to stop the Russian thing, as he told uh, NBC News. He... Uh, he's dangled part, but he's, he's it... threatened, he's intimidated witnesses in public. Well, meantime, the president is claiming he is innocent and tweeting today saying, quote, I am an innocent man being persecuted by some very bad, conflicted and corrupt people in a witch hunt that is illegal and should have never been allowed to start and only because I won this election. With me now is Shan Wu, a former federal prosecutor, and Elena Plata, White House correspondent for The Atlantic. Uh, welcome to you both. Shan, let me start with you. And, and Congressman uh, Jerry Nadler's claim that the president obstructed, obstructed justice, he said it is very clear that the president obstructed justice. Do you agree with that comment pertaining especially to Cohen's testimony, all the things that we heard from him last week? 
it does look like he has obstructed justice, but as a legal analyst, I have to pare it down a little bit. So there's this question of whether there's enough evidence that if I were a prosecutor, I would consider charging him. And of course, we're not privy to what the inside evidence mm -hmm. is. But looking at it from the outside, it looks like there is. I think you could have probable cause to charge him. There's just so much floating around. And of course, the most damning evidence is that Cohen apparently met with Trump's lawyers before he actually gave the false testimony yeah. to Congress. Uh, then the question becomes, do you think as a prosecutor you have enough evidence to convict him beyond a reasonable doubt? That's a little harder to say without seeing the inside evidence. But everything we're hearing right now are all defenses to it. And sure, he has defenses, but those would tend to be used after he's been charged. Uh, Elena, I mean, the president went after Democrats for holding these hearings, the Mueller investigation pretty hard during that really long, unscripted, freewheeling speech uh, at CPAC. Let's take a listen to some of it. I saw a little shifty shift yesterday. Now, it's the first time he went into a meeting and he said, we're going to look into his finance. I said, where did that come from? He always talked about Russia, collusion with Russia. The collusion delusion. Unfortunately, you put the wrong people in a couple of positions, and they leave people for a long time that shouldn't be there. And all of a sudden, they're trying to take you out with bullshit, okay? <laughs> with bullshit. Uh, yeah, so clearly uh, the president blasting uh, the investigation. Um, he also went off on Twitter about Cohen's testimony uh, just a few hours ago, saying, I am an innocent man. Uh, pretty remarkable to hear a president say that on Twitter. Um, are you getting the sense, Elena, that President Trump is getting a bit nervous about these investigations? Absolutely, Amber. I mean, we, we just know, uh, both as re reporters and observers, that um, Trump does tend to go off script and engage in stream of consciousness more so than usual when he is flustered by things such as, you know, Michael Cohen's testimony on Tuesday. The thing is, he, he didn't have much reason to feel that when it comes to something like impeachment, um, Cohen's testimony in the public, you know, would have advanced that necessarily. But with new reporting suggesting that it's possible Cohen may have talked with with Trump's lawyers about a possible pardon last mm. year. If that ends up being confirmed, I think that's the sort of evidence for obstruction of justice that would actually have more Democrats who have been kind of shy about using the word impeachment start exploring that avenue more explicitly. Yeah, let me ask you about that, Shan. I mean, if there was any talk or even a pardon offered, and again, we should make clear Cohen denied that uh, that ever happened, what would the legal implications be of that? I think in this instance, first of all, I have to make a caveat. It's such a unique circumstance that only the president can offer the pardon. Yeah. But it would look like a bribe. I mean, it would be suggesting that I'm going to give you something of value, which is the pardon, if you stay strong or even lie about it. So that's what the legal analysis uh, would be, that it looks like a bribe by dangling the pardon in front of him. Yeah. Uh, and Elena, let, let's shift gears for a moment and get your reaction to the news from the top of our show that Rand Paul, the fourth Republican uh, in the Senate, to say he will vote against President Trump's emergency declaration to build a wall on the southern border. I mean, this is quite a big blow to a signature campaign promise, even though the president says he will use his veto powers for the first time. I think it's an explosive piece of news for the reason that Senator Paul is actually someone who is close with President Trump and has been sympathetic to him, um, you know, in the last two and a half years of Trump's administration. I think when you have somebody like Senator Rand Paul come out and say, no, I will not support this national emergency declaration, you, you're, he's potentially giving cover to other senators who may feel similarly and now feel that because there is a Trump sympathizer, if you will, who is signing on to this, they they may now feel that, um, you know, they have license to go ahead with that, too. So what I'm going to be looking at this week is how many other Republicans, if any, come forward in the Senate to say that they won't support this. And, Shan, I mean, if the president vetoes these resolutions on the wall and it's ultimately handled in the courts, does the president have a strong case? Because obviously uh, this is something that his uh, closest advisors advised him against. And even Mitch McConnell was saying, please don't do this. Don't declare this emergency declaration before he actually backed the president. But again, I mean, the political fallout, the legal cases to ensue, how strong of a case would the president have? I think the president has a very weak case on the facts. But his strategy is going to be he doesn't ever want to get to the facts. He just wants to stay on the law. And the legal issue is very naughty because it's never really been tested. We don't know what the definition really is going to be 
of what is a national emergency. They might have to look at legislative history. On the law, he may win. I think we'll find out about that early because they'll test it just legally through some type of preliminary injunction litigation. And the standard there is going to be, is there a substantial likelihood of success? So I think we're going to get the legal issues straightened out first. But he's got to stay far away from the facts. <laughs> the more yeah. he gets to the facts, the worse it yeah, is. I mean, for him. What about the argument, quickly, Shan, uh, that, I mean, if this were truly an emergency, uh, you wouldn't have been talking about this for months and months and hesitating to declare one if it really were an emergency? Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's why the facts are really bad for him. And even the facts of people living on the border that say, I don't see this as an emergency mm. the way you're describing it. Shan Wu, Elena Platt, thanks to you both. Appreciate it. Thank Good you. to see you. All right, thank you.